And good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. On behalf of the AgriLinks team, I'd like to welcome you to today's AgriLinks webinar titled Addressing Food Safety in Animal Source Foods for Improved Nutrition. We're excited to have a great lineup of speakers joining us to discuss this exciting topic. Before we get started with the content, I'd like to provide a few reminders. AgriLink seminars are a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and, we are, and are implemented by the KDAD project. My name is Carla Fernandez de Castro, otherwise known as USAID AgriLink in the chat box, and I am a KM specialist with the KDAD project. I will be facilitating the webinar today, and so you will see my name in the chat box and hear my voice during the Q&A session after the presentation. First, the chat box is your main way to communicate today. Thank you to everyone who has introduced yourself. It's always really fun to see that we've got a global audience for these events. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat box to network, share links and resources, and ask questions about the presentations that we will pose to our speakers in the second half of the webinar today. Next, today's presentation is available to download right now on the AgriLinks event page for this webinar. Click on the link under Resources on the left of the screen or right here in the chat box. We are recording this webinar and will post the recording, transcript, and other resources to AgriLinks within two weeks. If you are watching the webinar right now, that means you're already on the email list to receive a link to the recording when it becomes available. If you are having any technical issues, please start a private chat with our KDAD AV Tech or let us know in the chat box and we'll try to help as soon as possible. Okay, let's dive into this. To give us an introduction to the topic and to introduce our panel of speakers, I would like to introduce Jennifer Lane, Animal Health and Livelihoods Technical Advisor with Lando Lakes International Development. Thank you, Carla. Hi, everyone out there in webinar land. We are thrilled for so many people to have tuned in today. We have a really excellent lineup, lineup of speakers who you've already heard are from all over. The, the webinar today is the third in a series of top funded events focused on livestock, animal source foods, and household nutrition. The next event will be in Nairobi in May. Please go to our website for materials from previous events, and there are presentations, PowerPoints, videos, and more resources. And if you'd like information about the May event or have colleagues in Nairobi, please direct them to the information sign-up form on the page, and you can see the link um, for up, that's about our Livestock Nutrition Learning Series right there on the, on the slide. Okay, on to today. We are going to look at addressing food safety and animal source foods and its potential for impacting nutrition outcomes. And apologies for the slides going crazy right now. We're going to work on that. To help explore this topic, we're going to hear from a panel of experts in this field. We want to keep this brief and maximize their time to speak. Their bios are available on the slides as well as on the AgriLinks website. First, we'll hear from Dr. Andrew Basson of USAID Bureau for Food Security in Washington, D.C. He's going to set the table on why this is an important topic to focus on. Then we're going to hear from two researchers from the International Livestock Research Institute. Dr. Hong Nguyen Viet in Hanoi will speak about using a risk assessment framework to evaluate pork and fish value chains in Vietnam. Dr. Sil Dr. Sylvia Alonso will tell us about working with informal dairy markets in Nairobi. And finally, Dennis Karamuzi will discuss a multi-pronged approach to cleaning up the milk supply in Rwanda. Dennis suggested that we serve tea today, so please enjoy a virtual cup of tea from Kigali. Following the presentation, we anticipate a rich discussion, so please type in your questions into the chat box. Lastly, I'd like to express our sincere appreciation to the participation, um, for the participation and the patience of our webinar speakers. Um, the webinars are a lot of work, so thank you very much. And thank you very much to AgriLinks and MicroLinks for hosting the webinar. OK, over to you, Andrew. Back again, folks. Here we go, second time, take two. 
So I'd just like to thank Land of Lakes for hosting this series of webinars. The role of animal source foods in food safety is an important and perhaps neglected topic, but one which I'm sure will continue to grow and grow in, in importance as the livestock revolution plays out. My introductory comments are intended to set the scene for today's expert speakers. Um, sorry, to, to, and I'll, sorry, my introductory comments are intended to set the scene for today's expert speakers. And I'll briefly recap, let me just advance the slides here. There we go. Great. So I'll recap the drivers of rising demand for animal source foods, the burden of disease relating to those animal source foods, and then introduce some of the challenges and promising approaches, particularly when we're working in informal markets. Previous webinars in the series have highlighted the important role livestock play for more than one billion livestock keepers, poverty reduction, improving nutrition, and building resilience, the key pillars of USAID's new global food security strategy. Safe and nutritious foods are critical to the development of a well-nourished population, particularly young children and mothers. Animal source foods provide high-quality protein and micronutrients, even when consumed in relatively small amounts. However, and this is the big but. It is critical that animal source foods are safe as well as nutritious. Otherwise, we take one step forward and one step back. Food systems are undergoing rapid and substantial changes shaped by powerful drivers in emerging economies. This is taking place at an unprecedented rate and propelling massive growth of the livestock sector. What people eat, where they eat it is also changing, the so-called nutritional transformation. And this includes the consumption of more animal source foods. These are complex, dynamic systems with significant interactions, co-evolving and continuously adapting. These systems create conditions which pose challenges for food safety. For example, with agricultural intensification of the production systems, we see higher stocking densities, increased contact rates, greater potential for disease transmission, increased use of antibiotics and, the, and associated problems, and potentially even the emergence of new diseases. Population growth, urbanization, globalization are all elongating supply chains, making greater distances from the production to the consumption zones, challenging traceability, storage, and making demands on the cold chain that can barely cope. There's an increased need for coordination against the growing number of actors within these food systems. These changes generating embedded risks, resulting in some unwanted outcomes, such as foodborne disease. These problems can be difficult to address where there are limitations in the governance of the food system and weaknesses in the enabling environment, on top of the existing surging demand for animal source foods. The policies, institutions, practices, regulation, and infrastructure are all struggling to keep up with the pace of change. This graphic shows the percentage growth in the consumption of animal source foods. We should note that in the high income countries, shown here in blue, demand is actually leveling off, it's plateauing. The majority of the increased demand is coming from the developing countries, shown here in red and green. And that growth is substantial. Projections estimate milk consumption in Africa is likely to triple by the year 2050. Poultry, meat, eggs, all animal source proteins are all surging and there will be huge increases in production and consumption. So the good news for the livestock sector is animal source foods are nutritious, they are in demand, and there is a long-term trend for robust growth. So then what is the bad news? The bad news is that animal source foods significantly contribute to the burden of foodborne disease. Foodborne diseases were clearly recognized as a health issue, but estimates of their actual burden hadn't until recently been made. In 2015, WHO completed a landmark report, the title page there pasted on, Estimates of the Global Burden of Foodborne Disease. This recognized the burden of foodborne disease as a massive problem, much underestimated prior to this report somewhere in the vicinity of the burden of disease for an HIV or for malaria or for TB. So really huge problem. And there are stri some striking statistics coming from this report. 33 million DALIs, 
are caused by animal source foods. That's the disability adjusted life years or healthy life years lost. 600 million foodborne disease illnesses every year. That's one in 10 of the whole global population. This leads to 420,000 deaths per year. Sadly, much of this burden is carried by children who experience something like 40% of the burden of disease. And perhaps again, sadly and not surprisingly, much of that burden is borne by the developing countries who are least able to cope with it. These numbers are hard to grapple with, but I think the key takeaways from this slide is just the sheer size of this problem. But also, on the positive side, that most foodborne diseases are entirely preventable, and we should take encouragement from that. So what is causing these foodborne diseases? Various studies and a meta-analysis of them have shown that between 30 and 80 percent of foodborne diseases are of animal source food origin. This is an issue the livestock sector must deal with. There are three broad groups of pathogens, the microbial pathogens, the viruses and bacteria, foodborne parasites, helminths and protozoa, and toxins including mycotoxins and chemicals. The graph here shows the relative contributions of these groups. And I saw in the, in the quiz at the beginning, you guys are, are spot on, that it's the, it's the microbial pathogens that really are in the top spot, often resulting in diarrhea, which accounts for at least 50% of the burden of disease. Tox um, the foodborne parasites are also a significant contributor. And toxins, including the mycotoxins, are a significant issue. It may be underestimated in this graphic, um, and we note very much the linkage between the mycotoxins and stunting and immunosuppression. And that's been the subject of previous AgriLinks Agri webinars, which I refer you to. This graphic provides a regional breakdown of the problem. It is not consistent, as we can see. Um, Note the marked regional variations in the overall burden of foodborne disease. We see on the left there that Africa carries the majority of the burden, with Asia a substantial contributor too. But if we look, and I've circled Europe, just to give us an idea, very low levels of foodborne disease in Europe. And again, this point that this is a solvable problem, that it is possible to get the burden down to very low levels. The second point is to note that the distribution of different causes of foodborne disease varies quite markedly between the regions. So diarrheal diseases predominate, the blue on this chart, uh, particularly in Africa. But in other regions, helminth parasites, the red uh, in the West Pacific and some of the Americas, the helminth parasites can be more, more of a bigger problem. Wet markets and the informal sector are generally where most people obtain their fresh food and where many of the key risks lie. Formal markets are not, however, necessarily safe, and informal markets are not always high risk. Regulatory control interventions can seem like the way forward, but experiences show that this is difficult and problematic. Approaches to close down informal market channels or overzealous regulation have not generally been successful, and in, often, in many cases can often do more harm than good. Whilst today's topic is focusing on food safety, there's a need to be mindful and to balance between the multiple desirable outcomes and competing priorities that face us as development workers. Improving food safety, yes, but also we must preserve access to affordable and nutritious food and support livelihoods of those producing that food. Oops, sorry, I just want to go back. So the final slide here. Um, foodborne disease is a solvable problem. And before we travel around the world to hear from our expert presenters, here's a menu of some proven impactful approaches and practices. A farm-to-fork approach, application of control interventions at multiple points in the food chain. The use of risk management as a systematic and objective tool to guide interventions. Engage the formal sector, that's where the risks are. Work with, not against stakeholders, and seek inclusive pathways to encourage progressive formalization. Align policies and practices with incentives, use scalable, appropriate technologies, and strengthen food system governance. And that is my cue to hand over to Hong in Vietnam.
Thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, good evening from uh, Hanoi. It is now 5 to 10 p.m. Uh, I would like to talk about the risk assessment for food safety uh, management in Vietnam. And uh, actually, this is very uh, dear topic to me and, and to our group. And as you can see here, this is actually coming from a very uh, great research partnership between International Livestock Research Institute and uh, our partners in Vietnam, including Hanoi School of Public Health and uh, Vietnam Agriculture University, funded by uh, Australian Center for International Agriculture Research and uh, CGA uh, Research Program, Agriculture for Nutrition and Health and Livestock and, and Fish. And actually, uh, I will uh, focus on three key points. The first is, uh, in fact, the context of food safety, in particular in informal markets in Vietnam. Uh, the second point, I will highlight some of the studies that we have been uh, conduct conducting in, in Vietnam on pork and fish value chain, but in a more umbrella context of one health and eco health. And finally, I will have some reflection on uh, the translation of research evidence into policy uh, in Vietnam. Uh, Actually, it's very timely to, to talk about food safety in Vietnam because, you know, uh, if you are in Hanoi, you can see a very great atmosphere of uh, the New Year, Lunar New Year of Vietnam and China is, is coming up in, in two days, in fact, and most of the Vietnamese are in holidays now, but food safety is important for them. And one of the recent research uh, by USAID is showing that food safety is among the most pressing issue for Vietnamese population. It is, in, it is more even important than education and healthcare for them. So, and to address this, uh, the Vietnam government has been setting up a rather modern food safety uh, framework that requires the use of risk-based approach. However, the reality showing that you know the application of risk-based approach is not uh, very uh, strong at the moment. And also another issue is really the perception of general population is very much on the issue of chemical hazard, chemical contamination of food. And in the city, in the urban environment and some other places in Vietnam, people are really willing to pay more to have safer food for them. But if you look at the global context, as Vietnamese we are quite good in exporting. So we comply with international standards to export our seafood but also as agri products. But when you look at the domestic market, the, the landscape is a little bit not uh, so uh, uh, very uh, positive compared to export uh, uh, environment. So that is a little bit the, the situation. And now coming back to the, the animal soft food, meat, milk and egg, and here actually I want to, to focus more on pork. This is very important in Vietnam because you know this represents 70% of meat that Vietnamese people eat, so we eat a lot of uh, the pork, we, we, uh, we have basically 28 million uh, pig uh, population in Vietnam and each Vietnamese is basically 30 kilograms of, of pork per year. So that is uh, quite a high level of pork consumption. But the, the interesting here is in fact, you know, more than 80% of this pork is mainly produced by very small and small farm. So it means that, you know, it, the farm varies from one, two, three, four, five pigs. It's considered it's very small farm. And it can go to until about 100, 150 pigs per farm. So this is really the popular scale that we are uh, ha having uh, in Vietnam. And also, you see, the particularity of this is, in fact, you know, we have many very small, small slaughterhouses, about 30,000 slaughterhouses in Vietnam for 90 million people. You can see that is quite small slaughterhouse dealing with maybe 10, 20 pigs a day. So from the hygiene point of view, it's not easy to manage. Another point of the Vietnamese population is, in fact, they want to eat the fresh pork sown in the wet and informal market. You know, we don't go very much on the supermarket. Supermarket supplies basically from 10 to 20 percent, depending on the, 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 the city. So the implication of that is, in fact, you know, this is quite affordable from the uh, informal market that address the local demand. Uh, but, however, some challenge can, can come from the food safety side that is not very efficient for, for control. And when this happens, you can see that potential risk for public health when they consume food. And it's very important for me to, to, to introduce here the concept of risk and hazard in the context that we are talking. I think that since we are in the next talk, we will come back to that. Uh, I am sure that you know already, but just to remind 
you know, hazards are defined as anything that has potential to cause the negative impact on human health. For example, salmonella from bacteria, you have heavy metal antibiotics, these own, uh, 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 how to say, items that can hazard, that, that have the potential to cause the, 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 the risk for people. And the risk is not necessarily uh, are the same as the hazard. The risk is actually the combination of the likelihood that something bad happened by this hazard we just mentioned and also combined with the consequences. It means that it's the severity of the, the, the consequence caused by the, the hazard. So please make sure that we, you, you make the difference between hazard and, and risk in the context of discussion today. Okay, it brings me now to showing I uh, use some example, concrete example that we have been doing in Vietnam. So the question posed in the past is, in fact, you know, so we eat a lot of pork in Vietnam, which is a smallholder and informal market. So what are the risks caused by the uh, consumption of pork in Vietnam? So for that, we use a so-called risk assessment approach from farm to fork, really from the farm where we raise pig, into the table where people consume pork by actually collecting uh, samples from the farm, slaughterhouse, retailer, uh, market, uh, from different samples, like environment samples, like water, uh, feces uh, from, from the pig, but also pork, uh, liver, kidney, in the market and slaughterhouse. But also we did the survey with the consumers to really understand how they prepare, they cook, and they consume the, the food with substantial samples that you can see here, more than 1,200 samples. And from that here, for example, I show you the prevalence. It means that the percentage of salmonella contamination. So salmonella here is a hazard for, for our risk assessment uh, context. You can see here basically salmonella is quite, uh, how to say, uh, prevalent in, in many samples that, that we, we studied. And more importantly, if you look at the market level, it means that we sample pork in the market. The salmonella contamination rate is worth about 34%. Uh, Whereas you can see also at the, uh, the slaughterhouse level and producer level, you can even found 20% of salmonella in, in water. So the environment is not so clean and the contamination is really uh, uh, seed uh, in, in the Vietnamese context. So I mean, this is very popular in the Vietnamese context and it's comparable also into some of the developing countries if you look at uh, salmonella prevalence. We can see also some other pathogens, for example, Tretococcus suite is a nasty pathogen and it actually is uh, existing in the blood of a pig. And the implication of that is, in fact, Vietnamese people sometimes they eat the raw blood of a pig. And when the New Year comes in two days, for example, many people eat that and you see the, the risk of, uh, of, of pharma, of uh, consumer by eating this thing. The other finding from the studies is also that you see when people bring pork, in the, in the house when they prepare, they have this kind of cross-contamination. So salmonella from pork can con contaminate as a food, for example, salad, you know, you have as a fruit by using the same cutting board and they, if they don't clean very nicely, but also it can be contaminated from the knife uh, uh, from um, uh, when they, they, they cut the, the, the pork. And finally, on this, uh, you see collection of data with some uh, modeling and simulation, etc., combining micro microbiometers and also epidemiology. Give us some results, like for example, basically 12% of Vietnamese population uh, uh, has the risk of, uh, of salmonellosis uh, yearly. It means that uh, basically one of 10 person per year uh, uh, having problem with salmonella when they, they eat pork in Vietnam. And we can also show from sensitivity analysis that handling practices at the household level and the prevalence of pork sold in the market are the key parameters, key factors that lead to the risk of uh, salmonellosis uh, of Vietnamese population. Uh, when we looked at the chemical hazard, uh, and here, you know, I remind you chemical, it means here on our context, you know, these antibiotics residue, some heavy metal, but also the growth promoters like beta agonist and sabun tamun that was banned actually by Vietnamese law uh, because you know Vietnamese people concern a lot about chemical hazards so we want to understand if it's really the risk coming from the chemical hazard so we sample many uh, uh, places in the value chain and, it, and like you can see here is the negative 
uh, is reflected by green and the red and orange by positive. So you see, it's a basically, yeah, uh, uh, most of the sample are, are negative for antibiotic residues and heavy metals, except for some of the, the, the antibiotics, uh, but the, 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 the rate is rather low for that. And if you look at here in the next slide, you can see and so that most of the sample are ne were negative or they did not access the current uh, the MRL, it means that the maximum uh, residue level defined by Vietnamese regulation. So, you know, the highlight from this study is in fact, you know, even people are concerned a lot about chemical uh, contamination from pork uh, uh, perspective. We don't see that from this study as a very major issue of uh, food safety in Vietnam at the moment. Let's move now from pork to fish because fish is also very important for, for Vietnamese diet. And here I want to show you, put you in the context of one hell and eco hell. What does it mean? It means that you know people raise pig, fish, grow vegetable in a very uh, integrated agricultural system. As you can see here, Vietnamese farmers have very sm uh, small land, so there they raise animals, livestock. They have a small fish pond where they raise uh, fish, but they have also the crop, the garden for vegetable. So everything is interconnected and so the reuse and the recycling, it is very, uh, how to say, uh, uh, clear in, in Vietnam. So, uh, uh, here the context is in fact, if you look at the next line, you have a very polluted water from the canal or from, uh, the, uh, from the river coming up uh, uh, from the city, night. 89% of which were in developing countries not treated. People can fish uh, in this kind of polluted environment and they eat this contaminated, contaminated fish. So we conducted a study in Hanam province that 60 uh, kilometers uh, uh, from uh, Hanoi and uh, in fact uh, we examined the level of contamination of uh, tilapia fish growth in this uh, polluted river and here you can see, for example, you know, the water uh, contamination level in heavy metal was quite high for uh, lead and cadmium, both in water from Canaan and uh, tilapia. I, I'm, I'm sorry for the title for the name of <laughs> tilapia. Uh, so, but when you look, uh, when you do a risk assessment, it means that we survey how people, how local people consume, how many times they eat tilapia per day, per week, per year, for example, and, and calculate the, the, the portion that people eat. You know, the TDI, it means that basically the total uh, daily ingest of heavy metal in lead and cadmium was also quite lower than the acceptable level defined by the country. So it looks quite serious in terms of pollution, but finally, when you come to the risk issue, the level is not so uh, huge like people perceive. But also, you can see also that you know you have a behavior issue here and, and the knowledge issue uh, playing an important role here in the sense that you see uh, uh, people sometimes they know uh, that is polluted, so sometimes they don't eat this fish, but they sell this fish to another area that the consumer are not aware of the situation, for example. So these are from the communi risk communication point of view and risk assessment is very important to, to really understand where is the risk and how to manage uh, this risk. So uh, shortly uh, to summarize from this two case study on pork and fish, we think that you know, this, combining these different disciplines to work on risk assessment is important. This is a so-called one health basically. We have an issue of risk misset, misperception of what people worry about is not necessary what makes them sick for the case of microbial and, and chemical uh, hazards in our uh, study between uh, pork and, and fish and also we could identify the factors that influencing more the risk that, so that it can lead to the intervention to reduce the risk. My last two minutes I would like to share with you uh, our experience on working with the policy to translate the evidence into uh, uh, a practice for the food safety risk assessment. You know that in Vietnam, as I said from the beginning, they have a very nice law of food safety where they define the risk-based approach, meaning risk assessment, communication and management. However, when you look at the crowd level, not a lot of things have been done so far. 
and, and among other things, that is because of the capacity of local partners, but also at the ministry level. So, us from INRI and a national partner, we set up a national task force for risk, uh, food safety risk assessment in Vietnam, uh, uh, bringing 20 experts in Vietnam from ministries, but also from research institutes and universities to work together to do training in risk assessment, but also really doing the hand-on risk assessment for the country. And when we have the result, in the parallel, we approach people from Ministry of Health, uh, like you can see here in 2011, we went to talk with people from Ministry of Agriculture, they are in charge of food safety, and all this result and evidences uh, can lead recently to a more comprehensive report led by World Bank and other development partners, commission to Indian partners, really to bring all this evidence into the government level. For example, we came to talk with the, uh, the people from the government, like Deputy Prime Minister, about the food safety risk assessment in country that eventually would lead to a larger project to intervene the food safety in Vietnam. Let me conclude by bringing a few key takeaway messages uh, for you. Uh, from our experience, we can see that pork and fish are important for Vietnamese diet. So the question is, in fact, how to balance the formal and informal market to really uh, control the safety aspect of fish and, and, uh, and pork in Vietnam? We can see from this experience also that you know, the risk assessment is quite useful tool for food safety management in Vietnam, but we really need to adapt uh, that to the local context and also to build the capacity that is needed to conduct these things. The risk misception uh, issue is also is very important, I, I, and I think that we need more evidence to show where would be the priority of risk to intervene, and finally, to work with policymakers in this type of country, I think that we need to be persistent, opportunistic, and very timely uh, for, 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 for really translate our uh, evidence from research into uh, the uh, policy uh, in food safety in the country. And with that, I would like to thank you for the attention, and I hand over to uh, my colleague, Sylvia Alonso. Thank you, Hong, and um, hello, everyone. So let me take you now all the way down to East Africa. I'm going to be talking about uh, Kenya, the informal um, milk sector, the informal dairy sector in Kenya. And I'm going to present um, an intervention that we, we believe can improve uh, milk safety, can help public health, and can protect nutrition and livelihood. So the um, focus of my presentation will be on milk. And I think there's no question that um, diverse diets, including animal source foods, are healthier diets. Well, we think we should cut down on, on animal source food consumption in, in the richest countries. There's also clear that promoting animal source food is needed in developing countries, and it is particularly beneficial in the diets of you, um, women and children. Milk is, is one of the best animal source foods in those countries for several reasons. Obviously, it, con it contains certain micro and micronutrients that are not available in other products. And in children, it's been associated with improved um, anthropometric indices. And compared to other animal source foods, it's relatively cheaper, especially compared to meat. It's more available in, in any low-income countries. You will have um, cow's milk, at least. And it's very suitable for children, especially for youngest children. But obviously, in low-income countries, what you mostly find is raw milk. It is actually the most available and affordable form of dairy in many countries, and this is definitely the case in Kenya. In rural Kenya, and I think that's the same in other, in other countries, probably raw milk is the only form of, of milk available. I mean, there's no pasteurized milk. In urban areas, the raw milk markets coexist with the pasteurized milk markets, but still, in, Peri in urban areas in Nairobi, there seems to be an, an, a preference for raw milk. And in fact, um, this it's actually cheaper, can be up to three times cheaper or more than pasteurized milk. People have their taste and cultural preferences. And it has wide distribution channels. You can find it in so many outlets. There's also door-to-door -door selling. So obviously, it's easy to, to get. It's, it's cheaper. So obviously, most people will consume it. But obviously, there is obvious and fair concerns around raw milk and public health. Milk is a very perishable, highly perishable product. 
and it's a very good medium for the growth of bacteria and, and including some very nasty pathogens for humans. There's no data really on, on how much um, illness in humans is caused by the consumption of milk. Um, but as my colleague Hong was referring to, the fact that milk might be highly contaminated doesn't necessarily mean that represents a risk for public health, because con consumption practices also have a say on that. In Kenya, the vast majority of people will boil milk before consumption. So that definitely that reduces the risk caused by raw milk. And then on the other hand, can we assume that pasteurized milk is safer? In places where the cold chain doesn't really work at times, in the cases where actually it exists, in fact, or where people might have a misperception about the safety of pasteurized milk without really knowing that, in fact, it requires certain ways of storage. But anyway, apart from this, I think it is the concerns of government are quite fair in terms of the public health risk potentially associated with raw milk. And in fact, in Kenya, the government has been very proactive at trying to address this issue in, in many different ways. One of the ways is obviously increasing regulation, increasing the spot checks, and, and you know, persecuting the, um, those involved in such markets. But um, on the whole, this, these approaches have quite, quite failed, basically. There's been other approaches a bit more successful. For example, promoting the selling of boiled milk. That was sold in the form of dispensers. And that seemed to be quite a successful approach and, and also something that uh, seemed quite promising. Now, recently, there's been also some concerns around the hygiene of those and, and you know, misuse of those. So nothing, you know, no other strategy is perfect, but that would seem quite promising. And the government lately has been actually trying to move towards a complete ban of raw milk and the promotion of pasteurization of all the milk that will be sold. So this is quite, um, quite an undertake, obviously, an undertaken by, by government. And we know that the raw milk is commercialized in what we call the informal uh, dairy markets. And, you know, these are disorganized markets with poor infrastructure, lack of cold chain, not regulated, often not licensed. So, well, I guess governments have, you know, fair concerns. But we have to also admit that in countries like in Kenya and many other uh, low-income countries, informal dairy markets have a very important role in, in other aspects. For example, in, an important role in food security. They provide food and for, for the most vulnerable and the poorest. They are also a source of livelihood for the population. They not, not only provide jobs and business opportunities, but um, they also pay, in the case of the milk, higher prices for producers. So they are positive for, for, for milk production. And in particular, they support women and youth. Women and youth are, are very involved in the dairy sector. So obviously, these informal markets support the livelihood. So a ban in the informal sector will obviously, could have, could have, unintended consequences that need to be um, looked at or thought through at least. So I guess my point here, I will summarize it that way, is not that we want these informal markets to stay forever. I mean, we do believe that in the long term this market will formalize, will become more modern, with more infrastructure, as countries develop and as the economic capacity of countries grows. But in the short, the short and medium term, those markets will stay. So we need interventions that will somehow work with the markets. With any other intervention that will try to suppress the informal market can be ineffective, anti-poor, and gender inequitable. So there goes the question from the main sort of message of my presentation. I can win-win options exist that will protect nutrition, livelihood, and still protect public health. I think that's what we should be looking at. So I'm going to present you an intervention that was implemented in Kenya about 10 years ago in that was quite successful at touching on all these aspects. It was a training and certification of daily traders in Kenya. So the traders were getting, which were not licensed by government or anything, they were just working, let's say, illegally. They were just being provided with training on milk quality, milk hygiene, how to recognize high-quality milk. They were given business skills, 
and training on value addition, so they could actually use the milk to produce yogurt and other products. And then they will also be getting a certification that actually they could present to the authorities, and that will facilitate licensing. So obviously that was a, an entire incentive for the traders, the fact that government will, they will be somehow legitimized in front of government. So the traders were buying into it, government too, because obviously they felt that was a way of, of monitoring the informal sector that otherwise would be working in the dark. And uh, it was also designed to be sustainable and self-sustained, you know, touching on all these uh, incentives for all the different players. So the studies after the training and certification was implemented, and as I said, that was about 10 years ago, found that um, it had improved milk safety of those traders that participated in the training. The traders were very happy because they were seeing their milk was of better quality, they were having less waste, the consumers were happier with the milk they were selling. Unfortunately, the government buy-in in the long term was not as strong as it was expected at the beginning, so the, the approach didn't reach the scale that it could have. And although the same scheme has been implemented in other countries and it's been successful. So one way or another, the scheme in Kenya hasn't been as strong, let's say, as it could have been. But now we want to give the training and certification another chance. We have a new project that has just started in, in Yerby. It's called More Milk, Making the Most of Milk for five years and it's funded by the Villa Melinda Gates Foundation. And we will adapt the training and certification to implement it again. And we want to, in fact, gather evidence to see how well that can improve milk quality and milk safety, and at the same time improve nutrition and health outcomes in children in peri-urban areas in Nairobi. That's our pilot site. So we will modify this training and certification. We will transform it into a training certification and marketing scheme. The training, uh, we will recruit informal daily traders and we'll, we will give them skills on milk quality, safety, and hygiene. So pretty much similar to what uh, the scheme did 10 years ago. There will be a, an aspect of certification that will be pretty much the quality mark. So something that the traders can, can display and show their customers that they are trained, that they are better than all the other traders that are around, um, to build confidence of the customers. And then a marketing component, which is um, Promoting the, mm -hmm, promoting the um, consumption of milk among customers, so working with the traders and working out what are the messages that they can give to customers to pr promote milk consumption, especially for children. And let me just briefly go through what we believe is pretty much the, the pathways in which this uh, scheme will work to improve milk quality, um, health, and nutrition. So as I said, the traders will receive pretty much training in milk safety and quality and on marketing their milk. So we expect that because they learn how to um, recognize quality milk and how to preserve the milk and handle it, there will be less pathogens in the milk, less, less adulteration, because that is an important problem in Kenya. So if they can better check the quality of the milk, they are able to reject milk that might be adulterated and the quality of the milk will be better as a consequence. So this should lead, ideally, to better health outcomes in people, so less diarrhea, less foodborne disease associated with milk, and less, um, less weight overall. Because the milk is less adulterated and of better quality, obviously it will be more nutritious. So that will all lead to better nutrition. At the same time, the marketing aspect will stimulate consumption and of milk, and especially uh, feeding milk to children, and, and all that is all positive for the consumer. So what are the traders gaining out of this? So we believe that obviously the increased consumption of milk will obviously result in higher returns for the traders. Also the fact that the quality is of better, better, that the milk is of better quality will mean that there's less waste. They have to throw away less milk at the end of the day. So again, that will translate into higher returns. And hopefully, if actually, customers see that, um, you know, that better, better milk and more hygienic milk results in less health problems at the home, that will um, create more loyal customers. So all that are incentives for the traders to effectively put in practice and engage on this training and certification.
So this is a concept, it's a project that has just started, so it's early to, to tell you if it worked or if it didn't work. We have great hopes on it. Um, and you know, a few years down the line, we'll be telling you about what we are finding. But let me just give you with a few take-home messages from my presentation. So first of all, that raw milk and raw milk markets are important. As messy and as complicated they can be, they are important for many aspects, nutrition, livelihood, health. We cannot just look at food safety in isolation. And we cannot just think that any food safety strategy that has worked somewhere will work anywhere else. We have to look and manage the problems in a context-specific approach. And we have to try and often it's better to work with the, the sort of the source of the problem rather than suppress it, because that can have very unintended consequences. So let's look at it uh, from a holistic approach, find innovative approaches that can, you know, help nutrition, help health, and help public health. So that's the end of my presentation. And I'd like to move on to our next speaker, that is Dennis. I hope Dennis is there. Dennis, over to you. Uh, Dennis there in Rwanda. Um, can I get a nod from people here? Is, is that we lost Dennis? I think I think we will we'll keep working to try and bring Dennis in. Um, but um, Jenny, perhaps you want to take over from here. Sure. Fill in for Dennis. Dennis, we're really sad that we can't get you. We're going to try to get you on the line still. I think the network in Rwanda today is not going well. So um, Dennis is going to present about the recently closed USAID funded Rwanda Dairy Competitiveness Program. <laughs> yes, please Hello. go ahead. Can hear you. Can you hear me? Hi, hi, hi. How are you? My name is Dennis. As uh, I just got introduced, very sorry I'm having uh, internet uh, problems here, but I hope that we'll be able to make progress. Uh, as uh, they probably already introduced, uh, I am presenting a case of uh, Rwanda in which we have employed a multi-pronged approach to cleaning up the milk supply chain. And uh, I should say I'm privileged to speak after both Nguyen in Vietnam and uh, Sylvia in Nairobi, because a lot of what they provided as background uh, gives a, a good uh, starting point. Uh, going forward, uh, this is a program that has been implemented by Lando Lakes uh, with funding from USAID. And uh, uh, over the last five years, we have had the privilege of uh, uh, growing the Rwandan dairy sector. And cumulatively, it makes a 10-year investment that Lando Lakes, uh, in collaboration with USAID, has made here in Rwanda. And a bit of recognition to all of our partners, uh, uh, Africa Breeder Services Total Cattle Management, based out of Nairobi, inspired International, uh, who did uh, our financial services products, and the University of California, Davis. We have been privileged to work with a very committed team. And uh, going forward, uh, this, proje this project uh, has a very ambitious goal, as you will see. And our goal is that Rwandan dairy products uh, can be made competitive in regional markets. Rwanda is located in the heart of Africa, and being right there, there's a lot around uh, in the neighborhood that we do not, uh, that we, that could easily throw us off balance. So our goal was as ambitious as uh, the pressure around us. But uh, again, uh, as a project, we were privileged to fall within a good timing, a timing around which uh, the government was developing the national diet strategy and set an equally ambitious goal, which says the competitive diet sector providing a quality dairy products which are affordable, available, and accessible to all Rwandans and other consumers in the region. So you can see clearly that the national goal was to actually give priority 
to the local citizens and gradually uh, pass it on to the neighboring communities. And so we started off from that point and uh, uh, as Lando Lakes and the implementing partners, we set out to understand the structure of the dairy value chain here in Rwanda. And as you can see from uh, that simple uh, graphic presentation, uh, this is a major uh, smallholder country, and that tells you that uh, a lot of the a lot of the success uh, comes from a proper or an efficient aggregation, bulking, and the delivery to the market kind of process. So we combined uh, several forces, uh, as you will see in the diagram, and uh, it combines what we call both the push. Uh, which is the effects around improving production, uh, which includes input support, uh, proper feeding, breeding, hard health, uh, training around the farmers and the aggregators, equipping, kitting, if you like, the basic kits that are used to test milk quality. And all of that helps to aggregate a good production at, around what we call milk collection center, and then gradually send it to the market. And as you see the structure of the market, we have a combination of large dairy processors, uh, not that large, uh, in the range of a maximum up to 150,000 liters per day. Uh, and then we have raw milk vendors or raw milk traders, if you like. And these make the bulk of what uh, drives the market here. Over 75% is driven by this informal market. And then we have the cottage processors, which are really small and they uh, could go up to a maximum, say, 1,000 liters per day. And those will not be more than, say, six if you look at the entire country. So looking at the demand, which is the pool effect in the market, we have worked uh, strongly to ensure that both our support on the push, which is at the production end, all through to aggregation, is combined with uh, an equally efficient pool. And the pool combines several things, you know, uh, price-based incentives that people will be motivated to aggregate milk through this approved process and approved I say because this is the one way that you can only guarantee that you track all the volumes as they come through. So uh, what the project has focused on is going uh, right from the primary producer through the milk collection center. We have up to now about 96 uh, milk collection centers across the country and we have been working in 17 districts. So we've had the privilege of handling the bulk of them. 76 milk collection centers. And these are efficiently used to supply uh, those different points. So up to this point, I could say, and uh, uh, like I had from the Nairobi case, uh, our, our market is, as I said, heavily driven by the informal sector. And that doesn't mean that uh, anybody would even be interested to close down any of them. So our priority has been cleaning up across the entire chain from the farm, the small producer, all the way to the market. Uh, and that provides a leveled ground for everybody to source clean milk. And that's what we call the multi-pronged approach. We aim to clean up the milk for everybody all the way up to the end of the chain. Uh, and so we have combined uh, a lot of the incentives as you saw in the push-pull uh, diagram. We have combined it with an enabling environment around the policy. So we have worked uh, with the government uh, to put in place uh, earlier what I said, the national data strategy, which provided a good basis, a good starting ground. We have worked on a national mastitis control strategy with the University of California, Davis. We have combined that with the, uh, some guidelines around what we call a ministerial order, uh, with some packaging uh, policy that helps to determine or rather to uh, associate with the real problem that we have in this country, plastic is banned. That means all of the efforts must be put into uh, initiatives that can promote bulk selling uh, without necessarily packaging in plastic. We have initiated what we call the sector sub-working groups, which help to advance the problem wherever it is. And then we have worked with the private sector federation to establish what we call the Rwanda National Data Platform. And now this is a platform that will continue beyond the project life. And then from the push end, we have supported a very strong consumption campaign and which blends very well with the ongoing efforts around improving milk consumption in schools. Now, going back uh, just quickly, the, the real problem has been a lack of enforcement. I mean, we, we have all these guidelines in different directions, but a proper enforcement guided by 
some proper documentation of what the issue is has been a problem. Incentives from the pool end that help people to actually improve the quality. Uh, infrastructure along the cold chain has been mainly limited. And then traditional consumer preferences. People here don't necessarily drink from the supermarket. Many drink from the farm. So we aim to clean up the milk uh, from the farm so that as it encounters the different buyers, it is clean all the way. And then knowing uh, the limited processing capacity, as I told you earlier, uh, this remains a challenge. But we were well aware and worked towards cleaning up the milk so that at whichever point you will need the milk, it should be a clean product at that point. And then, uh, of course, uh, issues around infrastructure that I will not uh, uh, take a lot of time. So our priority has been focused on cleaning up the milk right from the primary producer at the aggregation, as you can see in this little picture. Uh, it demonstrates somebody at a milk collection point testing the milk as they feed it. And at that point, before they uh, uh, reject or approve, they will have tested the quality of that. So we have distributed kits all the way. And so uh, what we combine is both the software, which is the knowledge from the training, and then the hardware, which is the mix of the kits and the actual equipment, the bulk collection equipment. So in effect, we have uh, started what we call the seal of quality. It started more of the concept of what we can achieve together, aiming at uh, distribution of quality testing kits all along the data chain. And so we have worked uh, uh, to improve uh, transport logistics, advocating for certification through what we call the Rwanda Agriculture and Livestock Inspection Service. We have trained cheese makers, and as you know, many of you, cheese is usually, in, in our case, usually made in many of those places that are not able to access the market. So those were a primary target to ensure that they understand the basics of quality because their product is likely to be out there in the market if it did not receive attention. So we have worked a great deal on improving the product around uh, those uh, uh, cheese as it comes out to the market, all the way from processing or cheese making to branding and marketing. And uh, as you see in the little demo, uh, the, the, it, it demonstrates the little aggregation point as you bring the milk together, the different testing kind of tools that could be brought into play. And uh, majorly that is what the project has supported too, uh, provide the hardware, uh, but in addition, uh, complement that with the proper training that uh, has been provided. So what you see in the next picture is uh, a gentleman at a milk collection center, properly dressed, properly equipped, and those are called seed of quality enabled milk collectors. So across the board, we have achieved less uh, 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 milk being rejected uh, to a point of almost zero for many collection centers that have enrolled. And we have also, in a way, uh, using this uh, army of uh, milk collectors, uh, well-trained guys, they also act as uh, the people. They are more or less the gatekeepers. I mean, they are responsible for inspecting quality and gradually helping everybody across the board. So this is at the milk collection center level, where the traders or the transporters deliver their milk. It is sieved, it is tested, it is received into a bulking tanker before a transporter can come out and pick it out. So, uh, we have combined, as I said, software and hardware, and as you can see in this uh, picture, you see that uh, this is from a traditional cooking stove where they are boiling milk to a batch pasteurizer system, which we have promoted across the different uh, uh, what I call cottage kind of processing points. Uh, at the milk collection center, we have promoted more of bulk holding that they can link up with traders more efficiently. So we have improved the processing capacity. We have improved the, the, the holding capacity. Now, going to the peri-urban market especially, we have worked with the largest processor, uh, who I earlier said, and we have uh, tried to be innovative, understanding the traditional preferences for bulk, for people buying five liters plus, uh, packaging uh, being banned as plastic. So what we have worked with the processor to innovate is the milk zone, which is a retail center where you sell milk uh, and people bring their tanks, bring their jelly cans to just empty into their tank. So what we have promoted uh, includes both uh, the practice itself, understanding that this is fresh pasteurized milk, not unboiled milk or uncooked milk, and then it is delivered uh, right where you want it. And so uh, over the life of the project, uh, we have achieved uh, from zero, zero of these uh, milk collection centers or rather milk zones, which are points of pasteurized milk, 
we have grown to over 85 in a period of less than three years. It includes a proper packaging of a franchise mechanism where traders graduate from an informal trade business and enroll on this more profitable business that does very well for them. Uh, going towards the end, I think that's a, that emphasizes more the point around the milk collection centers and then the milk zones uh, from the uh, peri-urban consumer. Now, I wanted to talk briefly about, uh, to, about uh, uh, the Shishaumba. We have uh, promoted a national campaign which generally promotes milk as a very high quality product in terms of nutrition. So it combines the knowledge uh, of uh, nutrition uh, uh, across the board. Hello, I, I hope you can still hear me. Uh, uh, I wanted to move forward to a one cup uh, per child program, uh, which is the program that has been supported by the program. Uh, the fact that you can hear me, I hope I'm not exceeding the time. I lost a bit of uh, the connection at some point. So we have complemented uh, the, the consumption program with what the government has been driving as one cup per, poor ch per, per child program, which is an aim to improve uh, the uh, nutrition across the board starting with the younger ones in school. Now, the multi-pronged approach, as I told you earlier, uh, it brings together uh, a lot of effort around uh, the milk collection chain, and what we have put in place is a seal of quality, and combine that properly with the, a behavior change communication campaign that helped everybody to graduate uh, from a low quality, uh, limited supply kind of product to a much more stable supply, higher quality product and that helps to provide a cleaner, safer, affordable, and available product for all. Uh, going forward, uh, key takeaways uh, from my presentation, uh, uh, hopefully keeping within the time, we have worked to increase access uh, to affordable, nutritious, cleaner milk across the board. Uh, and then it is important, as we have observed, uh, to maintain a good uh, relationship between the push-pull kind of effects, uh, where the real motivation is actually in the market. You know, the market is what is pulling. Uh, the push is all of the forces that are happening at the farm. Now, with the farm, uh, I think uh, on-farm testing helps extend the level of accountability across the board and helps everybody participating in this chain to be much more accountable. We have also understood that incentives, especially based on price, are very important. And uh, in our case, all of the effort we have put into play could not be even better if we did not achieve a government endorsement of all the work through uh, an enactment of a national policy that is currently guiding this entire process. Uh, and then uh, we have also determined that uh, depending on the cultural preferences, uh, you know, milk sales uh, are, are determined by a consumer demand. And so in our case, a case of, say, the milk zone has been very instrumental in transforming the culture of consumption. Uh, I also want to mention the collaboration between the processors and the milk collection centers and the nationwide milk consumption campaign that contributed largely uh, to put into play all of the forces that applied to clean up the milk chain. So in brief, uh, all of these uh, points have been brought together into play in the implementation of the program in addition to a wide range of other uh, kind of important aspects of the program. Uh, so uh, going back a little, uh, I probably spent a lot more time talking about uh, the program around quality. But I wanted to also let you know the program has uh, extended beyond quality. We have talked about policy as you had. We have talked about uh, business development around the milk collection centers. We have been a strong force around enforcing quality. And uh, we have uh, generally talked about consumption. And so combining all of those uh, could not be better, uh, in, you know, without uh, the implementation of a, a cleaner milk for all kind of approach. So uh, I believe I have tackled most of it. And I would like to thank you very much for being very patient with me. I lost a lot of the connection, but I trust that you have been able to follow. And I'll stay online uh, for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis, and to all of our presenters. This is Jenny, Jenny again from Land O'Lakes. 
We're going to go now into the question and answer session. There's been an incredibly rich discussion and questions going on in the chat box. So thank you to everybody. We don't have a lot of time, so we won't be able to get to everyone. However, hopefully there's maybe an option that we'll be able to have kind of an online chat on another date that AgriLinks may also be able to host on this topic, and our speakers might be able to respond um, with some written responses to some of our questions as we group them. I do want to, before we go to the questions, just flag there's been a few questions regarding mycotoxins and aflatoxins. As Andrew mentioned earlier, AgriLinks has had multiple webinars, and there are a lot of resources on aflatoxins and mycotoxins in, in not just animal source foods, but all sorts of crops. That is outside of the scope of this talk. Um, we do know with very good science from the World Health Organization that the, gro the global burden of disease of foodborne illness in animal source foods is primarily from bacterial and parasitic infections. So that's why we kind of chose to focus on the management strategies for those issues in these talks. So I encourage you to look at AgriLinks for resources for mycotoxins and agri um, aflatoxins going forward. Our first question that we're going to go to is for Hung, and he is going to um, ask him to speak to the, the data collection and how you address the issue of lack of data. For instance, th is this maybe a reason why there's limited antibiotics in food of origin? Is, there, is that a, a data problem, or is it because you know there's data there and it's just not kind of coming out in what you found? So back to you, Hung. Uh, good evening again uh, from Hanoi, this home speaking. Uh, thank you very much for the interest and, and question. Uh, I can see here some concern from colleagues about the data, lack of data in risk assessment. You see, as I mentioned uh, from the beginning, risk assessment is not new to one of us, but in terms of implementation, appli application of risk assessment for food safety has been rather recent for, for Vietnam. And in this type of context, we need to really to adapt to the local context, but also to develop kind of new approach to conduct risk assessment. So coming back now to the lack of data, for example, we look for the data of uh, meat consumption, for example, and specifically for pork in Vietnam, you don't, you didn't really have it for, for pork specifically. You have the meat consumption for every type of meat included. So in this type of thing, you know, either we conducted ourselves the survey, the survey from the study site, uh, by, for example, you see a convening kind of focus group discussion uh, to really uh, involve partners and, and, and uh, stakeholders of value chain to provide information for our risk model uh, for that. Uh, the second question is about the low level of antibiotic residues uh, uh, in, in pork in Vietnam, that is actually the, the data speak themselves uh, from our study. So I think that you know, we need to, to make it clear here, in fact, the situation of AMR, uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance, is quite uh, important and, and increasing in developing countries, including Vietnam. And that actually, we didn't deal with that in the framework of that study. However, the antibiotic residues seem to be quite low. Uh, uh, in, in our surveys, and I think that one of the reasons uh, uh, for, for this low level of antibiotic uh, uh, residues, in fact, maybe uh, the livestock uh, sectors in Vietnam manage quite well uh, uh, from that side, but also the, the, from the vet services point of view, which holding a period for, for antibiotic uh, treatment is quite nicely kept for this area of, uh, of study in Hung Yen and Nghe An province uh, too province in the north and center of Vietnam. Over uh, to you, uh, Jenny. Super. Thank you very much for that. OK, the next question is for Sylvia. Sylvia, we have a listener inquiring about milk certification. And if customers were willing to pay a higher price, and how much did that price increase? And kind of trying to get to the question of uh, balance between affordability of the product and product quality. Right, thank you, Jenny. So yeah, that's a very relevant question. When uh, the training and certification was implemented ten years ago, um, for the you know the beginning actually that does not necessarily translate into an increase in price. 
the price of the informal sector is, is very, very determined by the market. I mean, there's a very competitive market. There's so many uh, retailers and, and traders selling, selling raw milk that obviously a trader that might go through a training cannot allow himself to just increase the, the, um, the price. So it did not result in that. Whether people would be willing to pay a premium uh, in terms of higher price for better quality milk, I do believe that in the long term they may. Obviously, it's all determined by the purchasing capacity of, of the customers, which in certain contexts is very low. But um, I mean, from our talks to traders, they seem to report that their customers were, um, you know, clearly happier with the quality of the milk. They, um, that the traders were selling, the traders were very happy with that. They could see that the customers were sort of coming to them. So while it might not be immediate, so a, a, a customer might not be just willing to pay a premium, you know, after the training straight away, they may over time, when they get used to, to that higher quality and do, they learn to sort of appreciate it in the long term, then that might result in, in customers to be willing to pay smaller, very small amounts of higher price for that better quality raw milk. But that is something we actually didn't observe back then. Um, so yeah, so to me that, that, is the, um, that is the key. I'm not sure that the second part of the question, if uh, Jane, you can repeat it, or will that answer what the question is? I, I think you captured most of it. We can go on to Dennis. Thank you, Sylvia. This is Jenny again. OK, so for Dennis, there was multiple questions regarding kind of incentives for producers to bring their milk, their milk to the collection centers rather than going through more informal channels. And what are the benefits for people to, that are participating kind of in the milk collection centers? And in that same vein, there was also a question regarding kind of these milk collection centers and how they're financed as standalone business entities or um, where they get their kind of funding from if they were part of the project or if they're going to continue on after the project. Over to you, Dennis. Yeah, thank you very much, Jenny, uh, and a very good question at that. Uh, uh, of course, uh, this, this whole structuring of the dairy business has happened in the midst of a, a chaotic kind of environment where the whole country is only trying to rebuild uh, across different sectors. So over the years, government has invested quite largely through different mechanisms on establishment of what we call the milk collection centers. And they have struggled uh, quite uh, frankly with the, the actual functionality of the MPCs because the ownership is uh, at this point with the milk cooperatives. So what you have seen, uh, I, uh, I would like to go back to that slide that structures the, the market. Uh, but what you have seen as I navigate back, uh, I don't know if the host is holding anything. Um, what you have seen is a, a mechanism that has been structured to be able to target incentives at different points. Uh, all the way from the producer, as you saw that uh, quite clearly, uh, helping the producer to understand the needs for their business to be able to improve, to be able to grow. Uh, so over the, year, over the time of the project, uh, what we have focused on has been mainly uh, trying to package around the entire chain. Say, uh, if you are a producer, you have received training, you have received the package of input, you have received proper extension care, and you feel obliged and connected to your cooperative, which is facilitating the provision of these services. And so what happens is the services around the milk collection center become the motivation for farmers, for producers to be able to enroll and supply their milk through this point. So it has been essential in our BBS training to emphasize service provision to the farmers, because that is the starting point. Uh, but on the other end, too, uh, the informal market, which is the traders around the different collection points that will usually cause people to bypass the milk collection centers, uh, they are poorly regulated. They, they are not properly registered as business entities. And farmers always risk losing all of their produce. And over the years, they have seen the difference between working in a structured market through a cooperative, 
through a recognized trader and long, you know, across the chain on the other end, a proper supply to a buyer who can guarantee payment. And in addition, uh, what we have done is to structure finance within this same value chain. So a transporter who has a steady relationship with a cooperative is able to source funding from a bank or a grant from the project uh, or even a long-term kind of contract with a, a, a milk buyer to be able to supply this milk uh, gradually, you know, uh, over a long period of time. So all of those incentives combine to help the farmer to see, uh, to kind of weigh the opportunity to actually formalize, if you like. So what we call it is really more gradually formalized milk chain uh, by providing incentives that don't necessarily outcome, well, they outcome the real sense, but nobody is actually forced uh, to get into this chain. So uh, uh, in simple terms, the real motivation is a combination of pricing from the pool end, a combination of service provision, uh, you know, improved BBS services around their milk collection centers. That's a very important aspect. If there isn't any value proposition to the other end, uh, to the farmers, the farmers will gradually go away and end up with a trader who pays cash. Now, uh, the last and most important, I think, has been the structuring of finance around this same value chain. So. While you are achieving uh, quality, uh, quality across the board, you are also ach achieving a lot of value addition to this entire business. At different points, the processor is able to acquire funding to grow their uh, purchases. Uh, they are also able to pay back uh, in time to the supplier. The supplier is able to pay back to the contracted milk collection center, and so on and so forth. So there is a combination of forces that uh, make the incentives across the chain. Uh, but as a project, our soft contribution, which is in the training, in the mentorship that provides both the cooperatives and the individual producers around the cooperatives to appreciate the long-term value in actual associated with this structure. I think that's the most important that I... Thank think. you very much, Thank Dennis. You. Over to you, Bart. Okay, we're going to go to a few more questions, but in the meantime, we're going to pull up the, the, the polls for the kind of your... Um, you're voting on how the on how the webinar went. The webinar is not over. We're going to keep on answering questions, but um, please answer those polls while you continue to listen. The next question is going back over to Vietnam. And Hong, is there anything that you could share about your experiences from working with the informal pork sector to mitigate the food safety issues since the order and command approach did not work? And was it because of ineffective enforcement of food safety laws and regulations? Over to you. OK, thank you very much uh, for this very interesting uh, question. Uh, I have to say that an Indian partner has been working a lot on the assessment phase. So you, you can show, uh, you can see some of the evidences in this assessment on, on health impact by eating pork, fish, vegetable, etc., like, like I talked. Uh, we are moving now to a new phase of uh, introducing kind of innova uh, innovative uh, interventions to reduce uh, uh, all this contamination and improve food safety in general in Vietnam. And that is uh, actually part of the upcoming uh, project uh, Safe Box, so-called Safe Box, moving from Pickris, as I show, to the new project Safe Box, funded always by Asia. Uh, experience uh, by working with informal pork sector. Uh, in Vietnam in particular, and in other countries, I would say that INRI has a kind of, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, experiences in different uh, informal markets in Africa, in, in South Asia, and, and Southeast Asia. And I think that, you know, the evidence shows the great issue of food safety in Vietnam now is really the risk communication uh, um, uh, issue in, in the country. I mean, uh, uh, consumers don't perceive uh, very correctly the risk that they they, 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 they they would have from consuming the food they buy. So, and also, you know, we have also kind of, you know, flowing up on by the, the media about the risk coming from food systems. So I think that, you know, we need to work more on the, that, that risk communication and improving the trust of consumer uh, to this buy of food. Uh, some of the studies showing that, you know, you know, the formalizing market, like supermarket, doesn't need necessarily lead to a very uh, safer food in, in some of the markets. So, so the, and from the traditional way, 
uh, like India said, we need to really help people to improve the food safety status in this informal market. And, and by that, for example, some example, example showing that the, the training uh, uh, and, and uh, branding things from really uh, from the uh, slaughterhouse to the market to make people aware that you know food is safer, but they need also to pay premium to, to get safer food because in some of the cases you know even you bring the safer food and that mixed with the, 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 the less hygienic food or meat. So that, that doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't create any incentive. So the intervention to what the incentive uh, uh, measure for that uh, need to be uh, promoted uh, more and more. And finally, um, you are very right to say that the reinforcement of regulation uh, is quite weak in, in, in developing countries. And for example, uh, if you compare the human resource of, uh, uh, you know, food inspector of the whole country in Vietnam, for example, is uh, equivalent to the number of in food in inspector of Bangkok City in Thailand. So, so you see some drawback and, and weakness in the system for that. So I think that you know, we need to really approach this thing from both ways in the long term point of way. I think that you know, the reinforcement of regulation is uh, particularly important for, for, for development in future. But in the meanwhile, we need really to find some solution like our uh, speakers, uh, other speakers uh, talked about in the context of Africa or here in Vietnam, really to help people to improve the food safety. I hope that you know I, I can give some element to to to, to answer the, the question. Over to you, uh, uh, Jenny. Thank you very much for that. Okay, we're just gonna we're gonna work on wrapping up, but Dennis has something to add from Rwanda, so we're gonna pass it over to him. Yeah, thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, an important aspect I wanted to make sure to bring up is uh, the restructuring of the market and cleaning up the milk uh, has been strongly complemented with a, a, a program, a national uh, primary production kind of certification process, which I think is something that Sylvia talked about. And in fact, it is adapted from some of the earlier work that IRI has done in Nairobi. And uh, we adapted it for Rwanda in a way that these milk collection centers that are participating in the cleanup process uh, are recognized, uh, first of all, through the different incentives that I talked about, but also strongly through a national certification uh, by the Ministry of Agriculture, which we call the Rwanda Agriculture and Livestock Inspection Service. So we have worked with the government, uh, with the department, to develop uh, a criteria uh, for evaluation of these milk collection centers, and they are heavily uh, packaged around the different aspects of milk quality, you know, right from the various platform tests at reception through into the business itself and how it, dry it is driven, uh, the kind of value they provide back to the farmers, and all of that comes together to provide what we call a seed of quality certificate. So it combines a set of best practices across the board uh, that are all aimed at improving the quality of the milk and also the quality of the business at the milk collection center. And as we concluded the program at the end of December, we were privileged to witness the first certification event of 27 dairy businesses out of a network of about uh, 17 milk collection, uh, 77 milk collection centers that we worked with. We had 27 of them awarded national certificates. And these will last up to a year, the license, that will allow them to operate and earn an advantage over the others for trading in a product that is already guaranteed of high quality. And an ongoing compliance check will happen uh, at different points during the year. And that for us has been a major success in the sense that it upgrades the primary producers to be able to trade, because in any case they were trading, uh, but in this case to be able to trade a higher quality, higher value kind of product. And uh, I wanted to be sure that uh, we can allude to the fact that uh, Sylvia raised something around training and certification. In this case, from their business. Thanks for Dennis. Thank, Thank you, you, Dennis. So I think that's an important thing that you had to add. Um, okay, that everybody, that is uh, that's it for questions. I think I'd like to thank the speakers again and AgriLinks. This has been a really valuable webinar. I think that the listeners have probably heard kind of 
some really good examples from diverse uh, fields and regions on how that both the informal and the formal sectors um, can play a role in this, and we need to find a balance kind of working with all along the value chain. And watching the chat box, there's also been kind of discussion about behavior change communications and linking this to actually improve consumption of animal source foods to improve nutrition in the most vulnerable populations. So clearly this is kind of, we're on the edge of some cool new work, and I hope that we can continue to lead some conversations around this with, our, with other partners, both here in the United States and around the world. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, the, all of the resources are kind of available. I'm going to pass this over to Carla to wrap up. Uh, on behalf of USAID's Bureau for Food Security, I would like to thank all of our participants for a really engaging chat today, as well as all of our speakers, Sylvia, Dennis, Hung, Jenny, and Andrew. Uh, it was a great chat. Everything will be posted on AgriLinks within a week of today. Uh, and please, uh, please continue to share on the comments section of the event page. Thanks, Paul.